Hey, FitHeads. Today we talk with Beth Bacon, a national level NPC figure competitor. Oh, but she's also a regionals qualifying CrossFit athlete and a national record holding Olympic weightlifter. What? And a nutritionist or like a, a nutrition uh, yeah. expert? Yeah, nutrition uh, coach. And... Like it was, it was just like kept going, and I was like, "Dude, you're so cool!" <laughs> and got bored with her, with her North Carolina life, moved to Hawaii. Now she li- lives on the sunlight schedule. I'm like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> so much going on in this episode. It was so much fun." And gives great advice. It's really nice to like you know hear some tips from a superhero. <laughs> you know what? Beth Bacon is a really did we not ask her the most important question? Are you actually a superhero? We That's her totally her pseudonym. We got to call her back. <laughs> Aloha. Are you, um, are you captain Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> captain Hawaii. She just sitting around like, um, someone asked her what her real name is. She said, um, uh, Beth Bacon. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to total fit. Serious fitness for not so serious people. Hi, Beth. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. So we got introduced because you worked with Christine and then I started looking into what you have done and it is remarkable. Uh, All of the things. (laughs) Jane of all trades, if you will. Yeah. Well, I guess, can you just give like a background a little bit about you? I don't know if it's going to take two hours or so. We might. (laughs) Might be here for the whole podcast. Uh, so I'm a lifetime athlete. I grew up playing sports, played sports all through college, uh, got into bodybuilding competitions after I graduated. Uh, after bodybuilding competitions, I got into CrossFit. And then after CrossFit, I got into Olympic weightlifting, where I've been spending the majority of my time for the last three to four years or so. Um, went to Masters Worlds, came in second place set an American record in the snatch. Um, So not too bad for this old lady, you know? (laughs) Not too bad. Uh, Fitheads, she glossed over the fact that she was a regional (laughs) qualifying athlete in CrossFit, didn't just get into it. And (laughs) and national level figure competitor, right? Yeah, so I came in um, came in fifth at Junior USA's in my first year of bodybuilding. Your first year? Yeah. All the yeah. the uh, old folks mad at you that have been around a while, like, ah, stupid newbie. Well, so they actually compete in, a, in, a, in a, just like they have Masters CrossFit and Masters Weightlifting, they have a Masters division for bodybuilders as well. So I was actually not, um, I was not with them. So you got it. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. And so now you're also coaching, right? Yes. Yep. So I have been just an avid follower of the fitness industry for a very long time. My mother is actually an RD. Um, so I grew up with somebody who was very intelligent when it comes to nutrition and how to fuel your body for performance. Um, and I worked for a company called lean bodies consulting for about two years before my husband and I decided to open our own business, Maui athletics. And we've been in operation now for about three years. That's awesome. Maui. You're in Maui. Hawaii. I didn't know I this. am in Hawaii. <laughs> so cool. Is it easier to be fit in Hawaii? It is actually, I mean, I, the amount of steps that I take since moving (laughs) here has gone way up because it's just, it's so nice to be outdoors. So I'm always finding 10 minutes here or there where I can go outside and walk the dog and just kind of get some sunshine and fresh air. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Step something that you stress with your clients. Yes. Um, we don't really prescribe strict step counts because I think that kind of puts a lot of undue stress on people sometimes of saying you have to hit, you know, 8,000 to 10,000, especially if they start off and they're pretty sedentary. So if you have somebody who's starting off and they're clocking one to 2000 steps a day, which we see a lot, 
having that person go up immediately to eight to 10,000 is going to be an almost impossible task. Um, but we do really encourage taking baby steps, no pun intended towards <laughs> raising that step count over time, just taking little opportunities in their day to move around more because that neat, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis makes up about 20 to 25% of your daily calorie burn, which is very significant. Your workouts, as an example, only contribute to about 5% of your daily calorie burn. So the amount that you move around, yep. The amount that you move around over the day. So, you know, talking with your hands or fidgeting or kind of tapping your foot, all those types of things comprise what we call non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And all of that movement, which includes taking a leisurely walk, makes up about 20 to 25% of your daily calorie burn. Walking is one of the most underrated ways to stay fit and healthy. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I knew it was important. I didn't know how much it outweighed me working out. Oh, yeah. So when I'm sitting on the couch oh, yeah. all day working and then, well, I got it in. <laughs> I went to the gym, but. Yep. Because you may have burned, you may have burned three to 500 calories in your workout, but over the course of your day, just moving around, you're probably burning 1500 to 2000. So it's a very insignificant part of your day when it comes to total daily caloric expenditure. Yeah. Is that the first thing that you prescribe when you're seeing a new client? Um, That's usually yes. And it's usually because most people are extremely sedentary. Um, We have people get pedometers if they don't already have them and watches and stuff like that are pretty crappy measures of steps uh, because they count arm swings. Um, So getting a pedometer that actually measures your stride is a much better way of getting a a true read on that. Um, Most of my clients, when they first start with me, I would say are averaging two to 3000 steps a day, which is very sedentary. Um, So those people are automatically going to start off having to consume much fewer calories than somebody who's taking 10 to 15,000 steps a day. So you always want to feed somebody as much as you can while they're trying to achieve their ideal physique, right? So the more that somebody is up moving around, the more that I'm going to be able to feed them. And it's a very easy thing to start to get somebody to move more, whereas other areas of their life may be a little bit more difficult. So even just somebody who, if they are taking two to 3,000 steps a day, just adding one 10 minute walk to their day and starting with that and then gradually increasing and finding other ways for them to take more steps. It's usually a very easy thing to do. Why do you call it steps? Why, why do you call it a thousand steps? Why don't you call it half a mile or 20 minutes? You could, you could, if you wanted to, it's just that most, most counters count steps. So in terms of relatability to the client, somebody is not really going to know how far a half a mile is, but they might know how much, you know, 5,000 steps is or 2000 steps or what have you. And that's also why we don't like to prescribe a certain number of steps. We sort of approach it as a, you need to move more outside of your workout. So what can we do to get you moving more? Get a dog, get two dogs. Get- <laughs> I know, right? Well, even people that have dogs, I, like, I, I see it all the time. People that have dogs are still getting like two to 3000 steps a day. And I have a dog who's insanely active and I get probably 17 to 20 a day. And I'm just like, what are you, your poor dog. (laughs) (laughs) Poor dog is sedentary too. (laughs) So you, you do personal training integrated with nutrition. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah. Do you put more emphasis on one? Do you find one is more important? Do you like, can you talk about, you know, the mix of that? Sure. And that'll be goal dependent. So I think that the exercise programming becomes more important when somebody is trying to build a physique um, versus when they're trying to lose fat. When you're losing body weight and losing fat, 
the working out that you're doing, the lifting that you're doing is to help you preserve mass, but you're not really going to be adding any mass when you're in a caloric deficit. So when you're trying to lose weight, nutrition is more important. When you're trying to build muscle and actually change your physique, I believe that the training is actually a little bit more important than the nutrition. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. What if I told you I don't want to get too bulky? <laughs> I actually am not, I'm not bothered by the, the bulky or the, the, a lot of trainers get upset by the word toned as a trainer, you know what that word means. I know when somebody comes to me and says, I want to be more toned, I know what they mean. I, it might make some people upset to hear that word, but you know exactly what somebody means when they say that, right? So in terms of bulky, what somebody wants to look like is completely up to them. Um, but I will still encourage them um, to be lifting really heavy. You need that heavy resistance training to physically change the shape of your body and how your body appears to you and appears to other people. And we actually do some intensity testing with our clients to make sure that they are actually pushing hard enough in the gym. Cause that's, that is the key that is really missing in a lot of people's routines is understanding where that threshold is for them. And a lot of people are really bad at figuring out where's that line between complete muscular failure and me maybe just not wanting to be super uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. I would it's just too heavy. I you know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and it happens a lot like I had a client a couple of weeks ago do some intensity testing and the way that we do it is let's say on your upper body day I've given you 3 by 8 seated dumbbell shoulder press. I'll have you warm up and then whatever weight that you normally use for your, your last set of your three by eight. So let's say it's a 25 pound dumbbell. I will have you take that 25 pound dumbbell and go completely to failure. Your form can degrade. When I say failure, I mean, literally complete muscular. You cannot physically lift that weight one more time. If you get any more than nine reps, you're sandbagging. And a lot of people will, a lot of people will get 13, 15, 16 reps. And so I'll say, you need to go up to a 30 to 35 pound dumbbell when you do these moving forward. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And that feeling, I think sometimes too, for people that have never really felt what true muscular fatigue feels like, it's a light bulb moment for them to say, okay, this is actually how I don't need to be this uncomfortable, but I need to be more uncomfortable than I have been. I think sometimes when your muscles start to burn, when you work out, people are like, Oh, you know, I'm nearing failure when it's really just your muscles burning. You're not actually nearing complete muscular failure. And you have to push through if you want to actually change how your body looks. So the psychology. (laughs) (laughs) What about going too far to failure? What are your thoughts on? Yeah, you can, You can do that as well. We typically have people stay within one rep in reserve, um, knowing that people are probably going to actually be two to three. Um, So you don't need to take things to true muscular failure. Um, They've actually been supported by science that you don't need to take things to that point every single time. Um, You should be about one to three reps in reserve if you're talking about physical changes to the body and adaptations to the muscle tissue. So you don't have to kill yourself every time. But Maybe just every other time. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> it's also mentally easier because I, I feel like it's so hard for me to find that point where like, was it hard enough? I know I could do more. So if you just go to, I can't do anymore, I guess I did enough. Right. Right. But then, so my question then would be, if I had somebody that was struggling with that is how are you recovering? So are you Horribly. able to, I'm yeah. Sure right now. So, <laughs> so that, that's sort of what you need to look at is then how does that affect your next day workout or your two days from now workout when your doms is really atrocious. So that would be something to look at with then to be, to see how that affects your recovery because that will affect your ability to progress as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And can we talk about this like muscle strength and, and building into older age? 
You know, I sure. I worry about sarcopenia even now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is as as women age, in particular, with the changes in estrogen that we go through. It is super important to maintain the amount that you're lifting. I'm actually reading a book right now called The Menopause Manifesto, which is written by Dr. Jen Gunter. Um, she's a phenomenal Instagram page. She's a great resource for women going through menopause, but she talks in her book about the importance of resistance training as you're going through or even approaching that menopause transition as you age into your forties and fifties, that keeping that weight training is essential for keeping bone mass, muscle mass, preventing osteoporosis, sarcopenia, all of that. It is super critical for people who are starting to get older to keep up with their physical activity. And have you found that there's pushback with that too? Maybe not the bulky problem, but just women at that age, not thinking it's important or not wanting to do it. I think they think it's not important. And there's also some messaging that I've seen um, as I've been going through this myself. There's messaging that you're not supposed to be working out in a super intense manner, that it spikes cortisol and all this kind of stuff that then makes you retain fat. And there's this fear mongering in general around maintaining intensity in your workouts as you approach and go through menopause. And There's literally no science to support that. Most of what we're seeing in that space is anecdote. So it's people just saying that they don't feel as good or, you know, they're gaining weight when it could be a hundred percent unrelated to working out that doesn't even touch what they're eating. So I haven't seen anything in the data that suggests that intense workouts spike anything that's going to then result in fat gain and adiposity. There's nothing that supports that. Okay. I'm going to keep lifting then. That's right. (laughs) You have to keep lifting. (laughs) It feels like there's always something that's like some weird far-fetched story that talks people out of working out intensely. (laughs) Have you found that sort of across the board or is, you know, is, is your job managing overcoming excuses or is your job uh, or how much of that plays into it? I don't see it. I don't see a ton of that. I will be honest. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of times people just let their own excuses kind of cloud their judgment when it comes to what they should or shouldn't be doing, or they're having external pressure from a significant other or friends or family or what have you. Um, that's kind of what I've seen in, in my job currently. Yeah. Um, do people come to you on keto or low carbs? I'd love to hear what you think about that. Perhaps whole 30 fat diets in general. I, I hate it all so much. Um, <laughs> but no, and, and honest, like my, my one takeaway is if it is sustainable for you, I'm going to be an advocate of it. So I have yet to meet anybody who is a top performer who exerts themselves in a very high intense manner, who is able to sustain that for years. I'm talking years and years and years on low carb and keto. Um, Again, if somebody can maintain it and they have success with it and they truly enjoy eating that way, I'm all for it because the most the best diet is the one that you are going to adhere to and stick to all the time without any issue. Um, whole 30. I, I actually did whole 30 when I was a CrossFitter. I was, you know, all the paleo, I drank the Kool-Aid when I started CrossFit. Right. So I did paleo. I was all indoctrinated. Um, and I felt like crap pretty much at all times. Um, I've done, I've done the whole 30 thing. Um, I think sugar is largely fear mongered. Um, that's not to say that everybody should be out there eating donuts all day, every day, but sugar is not addictive. There are no addictive properties in sugar. You don't see anybody sitting down with a teaspoon eating right cane sugar out of a jar. It just, you don't see that there's nothing wrong. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with, with sugar in moderation. And that's where sometimes the, 
IIFYM crowd kind of jumps the shark because they, all you see on an IIFYMers page is the donuts and the candy and the cookies and the can cakes, we, can right? We just define IIFYM in case some of the fitheads don't know. In case if it, it fits, fits your macros. macros. Yeah. Yes. If it fits your macros. And I was actually, I, this is the, the chat that I had with Christine um, in one of her biweeklies was how IIFYM actually came to be. I was around when the term was coined. Yes. So IIFYM came to be from the bodybuilding.com forums. I don't know that many people know that. So back in the day, people like, yes, people like Alan Aragon, who I don't know if you know, Alan, but he's probably the number one nutrition researcher in our field. His name's Alan Aragon. Um, He was a moderator on the bodybuilding.com forums and the nutrition sub forum. And he would have bodybuilders coming in all the time saying, I'm really tired of having oats for breakfast today. Can I just have a piece of toast? And he would say, sure, if it fits your macros. Or I am tired of tilapia. Can I have chicken? Sure, if it fits your macros. So over time, he got tired of saying, if it fits your macros. So one day in response to a question, he just typed IIFYM and poof, there it was. It's but so I not have, catchy. I know. <laughs> I, I, I am actually no LOL. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it actually came to be a way for bodybuilders who are on strict competition prep diets to sub one food for another as part of their super restrictive meal plan. What it has turned into is a complete. I don't even know. I don't even recognize it now, to be very honest with you. I see people playing macro Tetris, hoarding macros for the end of their day so that they can have those gross macro bowls. Um, People making ice cream out of friggin' cauliflower. Like it's just, it's turned into this (laughs) abomination of what the original concept was intended to be, which was switching one whole food source for another, not if it, if I can fit a donut, I should like, that is not the intended purpose of it. And as with everything in our fitness industry, there's, you always have the extremes, right? So you have paleo, keto, whole 30 here, and you have IIFYM here. And really we need to be meeting in the middle. And that's really what Alan and I do with our company, Maui Athletics. I mean, we teach people how to make the majority of their diet whole foods that are nutritionally dense, right? So you're talking fruits, vegetables, lean meats, non-fat dairy. I mean, all things that everybody should be eating in abundance. And then when you go out to eat, how do you approach that meal so that you can enjoy something that you don't normally eat without having it turn into this binge fest? Because usually when you're whole 30 keto paleo, you're talking restrictive, right? So what's the first thing that people on paleo keto, et cetera, what's the first thing that those people usually binge on it's carbs, right? And the same thing for the, right. Yeah. So (laughs) there's, it's, it's always sort of a, a pendulum that swings in the opposite direction. So we try to teach people how to moderate their intake of those types of foods when they're not something that they're normally eating as part of their routine meal plan, whatever that may look like. So that's my soapbox about IIFYM. So you (laughs) stick to your routine and then when you get off, don't get off too far. Yeah. I mean, there's a big, and I went through this in bodybuilding. Um, I actually developed binge eating disorder as part of my days doing figure competitions because the, the diet that I was following was pretty much, tilapia and asparagus for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like that was it. Um, so that talk about super restrictive, right? So what did I do after a show? I binge ate everything in sight, everything. And there was no stop. Like the hands kept coming to the face and I could not stop myself from binging on those foods. And it took me a long time to be able to actually go out to eat and sit down at a restaurant and not eat to the point where I was literally immobile, like so full that I could not move. 
And that's what we see a lot with these people who follow super restrictive diets is they do develop bad binge eating disorder because they don't have any foods that they truly enjoy as part of their daily diet that sustains them. And they almost always will end up binge eating. Yeah. Did you, I mean, sure. People keep it close to their heart, but did you come across this with other competitors? Is this, Oh yes. It feels like it would be common. It is very common. And what's interesting is it's not talked about a lot. Uh, At least it wasn't when I was competing. It was kind of the hush hush side of the industry. Um, It is extremely common because the diets are so restrictive and so low calorie. I mean, you get to the point where you're nearing your stage date and you're eating maybe 800 calories a day. So, I mean, think about how hungry you are. Well, I would and, just chug a bunch of water. Oh, wait, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. And that's, that's crazy. There's, there's really, there's some interesting psychology around it too. Um, there's a study that was done called the Minnesota starvation experiment. If you've never read it, it has some very scary parallels to the physique industry. Um, a bunch of men were essentially starved. They were given five to 800 calories a day for six months at a time. And they, I mean, it's an unethical study in today's society would not pass any institutional (laughs) review board. Um, but they studied these men and kind of what happened to them, uh, both physically and mentally. And some of the things that the participants in that study displayed are eerily similar to things that bodybuilders and competition prep display. So for example, um, in the experiment, they found that these men would constantly, constantly be looking at pictures of food. So people joke about food porn, but the bodybuilders, I would watch food network for 12 hours a day and just sit there and stare and drool and salivate like Pavlov's dog watching it. I would and probably start to release eat. insulin too. I've heard that maybe, that, yeah, that's possible. <laughs> And I would, um, meal time started to become ritualistic. So I would start to, um, I had very specific times of the day that I would sit down to eat. And if I was plus or minus five minutes from that time, I would start to get visibly agitated. Um, I also used to pace back and forth in front of a microwave as my food would heat up. Um, and then towards the show day, I started to hoard food. So I would go to the store and buy cases of brownies, cookies, donuts, pop tarts, like literally everything that I hadn't had. And I had a picture of it that I posted on Facebook. Like it was, you know, my prized possession of my food hoard. And I didn't think anything of this. And looking back on it, I'm like horrified that I made this post on social media glorifying this. And it, it was literally, my bed was covered in food and I ate all of it, <laughs> all of it. Yep. Did you ever make I a gained, list of things that you were going to eat when you were? No, I didn't do, I didn't go that far. Um, because as I would think of it, I would just go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I probably consumed, I would say probably 10,000 calories in the course of a day, like without blinking. And I gained 30 pounds overnight, like overnight. It, it's a horrifying experience. Horrifying. Max, yeah. you're nodding. Have you come across this in the wrestling community? Uh, he's, he's also I've, cut weight, but for wrestling. So I'm sure it's very different, but so it was, well, it was for a different reason, but it was the same stuff. Everything you're describing, yeah. we used to do all the time. Um, I would hoard stuff. I would have a, you know how people have like vision boards. Yep. <laughs> so yep. I made one of those, but first stuff I was going to eat after for food weigh-ins or whatever for food. Jeez. Yeah. I would watch, I really, really love watching my friends eat their lunch or dinner or whatever. That was really sort of bizarre. I just got, yep. you know, and you're like, Oh, it's no big deal. This is just, it's just cause I'm doing it. And then months or years you get some perspective on it. You're like, what, what was I yep. doing? Why yep. was I, why was that 90% of my brain space or day or whatever? It was very odd. 
but it's yeah, nice. we see that a lot in the weight and weightlifting too. When when people have to make certain weight classes, a lot of the uh, the female weightlifters in particular who are dropping multiple classes and doing saunas and all that type of other nonsense that you shouldn't have to do. Um, we see the same types of behaviors in those women as well. And it's just, it, the psychology behind it is, it, it fascinates me. I would actually love to take some courses in it because it, your brain and your body, you always kind of want to get back to homeostasis, right? So all of these things that your brain is telling you to do. So watching people eat, watching food network, it wants you to eat. It's trying to get yeah. you to eat. It's trying to get you to survive. And that's, I mean, that's part of the mechanism of getting back to homeostasis is your brain kind of doing these things to you. I mean, there's, there's so much psychology behind just dieting in general that people, most people don't really think about it. Your brain is always going to try to get you to homeostasis always. Yeah. And how much brain space it takes up. Like Max, you kind of touched on this, that you, there's so much you're not doing throughout your day because it's, it's just taken up by the fact that you're thinking about food or the next yep. time you're going to eat. And that yep. to me was a good indicator that it was an unhealthy, you know, whereas now when I find I, I'm eating well, I just, I, I don't really think about it much. I don't have these gluttonous, super yep. sat satisfying, I guess, meals or whatever, but I'm like, oh yeah, I had a nice lunch. That was fine. Now I can move on. To right. Bed. And that's, 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 in a, I guess, in a mental spot <laughs> that felt a lot more healthy than these. Yes, absolutely. What was, and was it is weird. I was going to ask, we didn't, one thing I noticed was, I mean, we were in college, so we were, you know, partying a lot, drinking a lot and not like none of us really had cravings for alcohol or drugs or anything like that. We just wanted food, a sandwich. <laughs> 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 I thought it was a weird byproduct. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Cause alcohol doesn't really have any, I mean, you're not, that's not going to really fill you up. Right. So your body's like, eh, we can do without that. Yeah. But a pizza yeah. That's another story. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing you probably don't like intermittent fasting or extended fasts. Um, that's another one where if that's how somebody likes to eat more power to you, it doesn't have any benefits for fat loss over a calorie deficit. So intermittent fasting is a great way to create a calorie deficit for a lot of people. Um, we're actually not opponents of it at all. I, I even have most of my smaller women in particular. So I have some women who weigh 120 pounds, but they don't have a That's lot of muscle. Small. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they don't have a lot of muscle and they're short, right? So they're, they take up less physical space is what I'm trying to say. Um, but somebody who's somebody who's 120 pounds, their maintenance calories are not going to be super high. So for somebody like that, who maybe also has a high hunger drive, limiting their feeding window actually makes sense because they're, if they, why eat when you're not hungry, there's really no point in eating if you're not hungry. So if you're the type of person who gets up and you don't really, you're not a big breakfast eater, you can kind of sustain yourself on a cup of coffee for a few hours. I'm a major proponent of that type of person doing intermittent fasting because it allows them to feel more satisfied over the course of their day versus having 1500 calories that you have to spread over the course of 12 hours. Like good luck with that. That's not many calories to go around. Um, the other scenario that we find that to be helpful is shift workers. So people that are working night shift tend to respond better to intermittent fasting. Um, so again, it's about sustainability for each person, but in terms of are there hormonal benefits or anything like that to, to intermittent fasting? No. Is it a way for somebody to sustain a calorie deficit easier for some? Yes. Yep. And when I get super low on calories, like when I was doing bodybuilding, I would actually eat only between like noon and 4 PM. 
because I was just starving all day long. It was long. a long so night. I, <laughs> yeah. But I can, I'm, I'm the type of person where I can go to bed hungry and it doesn't affect my sleep. I've always been like that. I, I can go to bed starving and I don't care. I'm fine. I can still fall asleep. I know that there are people that are not like that. But for me, that's why that approach made sense because I could be hungry you know, from 6 p.m. until 10 when I went to bed, I could kind of struggle through that and be fine until the next morning, have a cup of coffee, have that be okay until noon and then eat the bolus of my calories in a four hour window. And for me, that was a much easier way to sustain 800 calories versus having, you know, spreading 800 calories of tilapia and asparagus over, you know, 14 <laughs> <Yeah>. hours. <laughs> That's crazy. By the way, tilapia for breakfast, do not recommend. <laughs> Do not recommend. Where's, where's my pen? I got to write that. So disgusting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then can we talk about the transition then from bodybuilding to CrossFit? How did you go over to the dark side or the other dark side and then a fall? <laughs> leave that dark side. I actually, so I actually think it was for a guy. Um, and that relationship ended up not working out probably for the best. Um, but I started to date a guy who was into CrossFit and, you know, the bodybuilding community loves to talk crap about the CrossFit community all the time. And I was like, let me go see what this is about instead of just talking trash about it. And the first workout I did kicked my ass. It just totally kicked my ass. I loved it. You know, as a former soccer player, track person, like I, I like that feeling of having a, you know, something that kind of kicks your butt like that. Um, so I got into it and then, you know, sort of started to make friends at that gym and started to get competitive with it, realized I was good at it. Um, and so I started to sort of do more competitive type of programming, got decent at it, um, and loved it. I, I'm one of those people who I think training modalities there, you should do everything. You should do a little bit of everything. You shouldn't really pigeonhole yourself into, into one thing. And I think CrossFit is a great way to explore gymnastics, like things that you would not be doing as an adult. Um, it's a, it's a great way to expose yourself to different things. And the people that, the people that talk trash about it, I find don't they they've never done it themselves usually right so they don't see what goes into a kipping pull-up they don't see the number of strict pull-ups that that person has done to achieve a you know a, a gorgeous butterfly kip they don't see that that type of work um so i understand why some of the hate exists i have my own um, issues with CrossFit and some of the programming that I see. Um, and the lack of standardization of programming is probably my biggest issue with it in general. Um, but as a way to get people fit and to get people excited about working out, I love it. I'm, I want people to find something that they enjoy that is physical. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's running. I don't care if it's CrossFit. I don't care if it's powerlifting. I don't care if it's Olympic weightlifting, boxing, you do you. Just as long as you're being physically active, that's what I want. Yeah, if you were doing track and soccer, you said, then I imagine you like the competitive part of CrossFit. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on a team um, from 20... When did I join that gym? Um, CrossFit Suisponte in Raleigh, North Carolina um, from 2014 to 2018. Um, so we qualified for regionals twice, actually. Um, our coach did not send us. We qualified, but we did not go. Um, so we qualified two years in a row and our coach opted to send two of our individual athletes, which was kind of a hard pill to swallow, but we qualified. We qualified. <laughs> I can't imagine crossfitting with other people like collectively. <laughs> to yeah, we had to rely on me and vice versa. We had a really good, we had a very well-rounded team. So we had a couple of barbell, what I would consider barbell specialists, myself among them. Um, but we could hold our own in the gymnastics realm. Like I can walk on my hands, I can do ring muscle-ups, I can do all that stuff. But as a bigger athlete, it, that stuff is harder to do because you physically weigh more. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we, we had really good gymnasts. We had barbell cycling experts. We had people that had insane engines. Like we had a guy in our team who I watched his heart rate on his heart rate monitor go down while doing wall balls. Like I don't, (laughs) that's his rest. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, in what world do wall balls become your rest? I have no idea, but for him, like he could just plod away with like a 160 to 170 BPM heart rate and just stay there. I, he was not a human. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Team. Okay. So barbell yeah, we had a good team. let's, let's talk about now doing the Olympic weightlifting. I, that was what I love the most about CrossFit was the snatch and the clean and jerk. Um, I just, I don't know. There's something about the, the technicality of it, but also the, the grace. So you do have to sort of be nimble and agile and light on your feet, but aggressive and assertive at the same time. And there's something that just, I find a very well executed snatch in particular to just be a thing of beauty. And I really enjoyed my time learning how to perfect those lifts and all the little intricacies and minutia that go into it. Um, I loved it until I didn't. (laughs) And uh, I love to coach it now. So I don't like to do the lifts myself anymore. I kind of got a little um, burned out on it, but coaching Olympic weightlifting is like, that's what makes my heart the happiest. Yeah. That's crazy. Cool. I I totally agree. It feels like, I don't know, aggressive ballet. That's like, exactly. I mean, it, it is, especially when you watch those, um, those hook grip videos on Instagram where they show them in slow motion and just, they're beautiful. I mean, they're just, uh, they're the, the fact that the body is capable of doing something like that. I don't even know who invented the snatch and why somebody decided that was a good idea in the first place, but it turned out, it turned out awesome. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I think about that too. And it's like, I guess it's the idea of floor to overhead one movement. And so then when you engineer the most efficient way to do that, it's gotta be exactly how we're teaching the snatch, right? There's not a faster, better way to. Right. And then when you're talking about getting the most weight from ground to overhead, you have to bring that grip in. So it's just, it's just, it's really interesting. It's, it's a fascinating sport and there's a lot of, there's so much detail. I have lifters that come to me from CrossFit and usually their first few months are frustrating for them because they're, they're used to just, you know, clang and bang, right. Kind of just get the weight up any old way. And while that's all fine and well for, for CrossFit, if you're actually talking about wanting to lift the most weight in a competition setting in weightlifting, you can't just clang and bang. There does have to be a lot of technique work that goes into that. So for a lot of CrossFitters in particular, myself included, I had to sort of unlearn some suboptimal habits and relearn new ones, which takes a while because once you have that muscle memory to undo that, I mean, it takes thousands of reps to create muscle memory. So if you have to undo it and then redo it, you're talking years of time sometimes before you can undo a suboptimal movement pattern. And so it can be really frustrating, especially for people who are not as athletic, they tend to not pick it up as quickly and they get really frustrated, but it's a sport of persistence, if anything. Well, I imagine the, um, the mental aspect too, just like stepping up on that platform and then everyone's there and it's one thing you just do one thing yep. that you've been training over and over and you for. Get, you get three attempts at it and it okay. it's definitely a mental, there's a mental struggle and I'm a lifetime team competitive athlete. I am not a lifetime individual person. Mm. Um, so that for me was the biggest transition was I've got nobody else here. If I start to mess up, it's a hundred percent on me. I don't have my teammate to kind of pick up the barbell and keep going for me. Right. So there, and there is some interesting psychology behind it too, in terms of picking out your opening attempts and, you know, what those attempts need to be, you know, should you be more aggressive 
and save some room in the tank for later? Or should you start out with something that is super light that is going to jack up your confidence, but then that means your last lift, it's probably not going to be a PR. So are you trying to win the meet or are you trying to have a successful meet? And how you approach each meet will depend on your strategy for that meet. So if you're trying to qualify, for example, for something, you have to have a set number. You have to know what your attempts are going to be. And some of those attempts need to probably be pretty gutsy. So some of these people that you see like Maddie Rogers and Kate Nye and all these people who are on the Olympic teams, there are some meets that they have to open with a PR <laughs> in order to qualify. Yes. Yeah. So imagine that your first attempt, your first attempt is a weight that you've never put over your head before. And that's your first attempt. Oh my. I can't even turn a camera on without just turning. To noodles. <laughs> Ugh. It can be imagine. stressful. I mean, I, I never got nervous in terms of like stage fright. So I didn't care if people saw me mess up. That's, that was never what I was afraid of. I was afraid of just missing. Like I didn't want to miss. Um, I never in my entire career of weightlifting, never missed an opener, which thank God, because I honestly don't know, especially in the snatch, I don't know how I would have reacted to that. Um, that's very hard to miss your opening snatch. Um, but I did have meets where I went like two for six and just made my openers and that was it. And it is what it is. At least I totaled. (laughs) (laughs) I never bombed out thankfully, but that is, you know, there is a lot of, um, there's a huge psychological component to the sport. You could have somebody who's super strong and has great gym training, but then when they get to the platform, they're an absolute hot mess and you just don't know until you compete. How did you, um, or how do you coach people to improve on that? Is it possible? It is possible. You need a lot of platform experience. Um, so now there are some people that they've done one meet and they've said, this is not for me. I'm going to be a <laughs> hobbyist. And that's cool. Cause that person knows himself, right? They know this is not the setting for me. I am not going to thrive here. I just want to do this and have fun. Um, there are other people who hit the platform and love it and become addicted and just want to do meet after meet after meet after meet. And I find that person to be more difficult than the person who has a little bit of stage, right? Because the people that just want to keep constantly doing meets are never really going to get the opportunity to develop as a lifter if they're constantly in a meat taper. So it, it just kind of depends on the person knowing themselves, but the stage fright and the trepidation about being on the platform usually gets better with each meet that you do. You just have to be willing to kind of put yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it feels like you can't train that. I mean, you can turn a camera on, which still messes with me, but you really can't train <laughs> that feeling. You just have to do the actual thing. There's no yep. accessory work for, exposing yourself to a meet. (laughs) Right. And it was interesting during COVID, we had a lot of online, you know, virtual meets and it was an entirely different, at least for me, an entirely different feeling. I actually thrive off of adrenaline. So I would lift 10 to 15 pounds more in a meet than I would in practice because of adrenaline. Like for me, adrenaline is a hell of a drug. I can, if you slap anything on that bar, I will try to lift it and probably do a decent job at it. But when we had the online competitions, I like, I didn't have that adrenaline to push me and it felt much more like it was just kind of a sad experience. Like just getting up there in front of your camera, like nobody can see you. You're just recording your lifts so that you can enter them in the system later. Like you don't have other competitors that are, you know, you're watching them, you're wanting to beat them. It's an entirely different scenario on an actual platform versus that virtual platform. And part of the reason that I got burned out on weightlifting was because of all that virtual stuff. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And for a long time, especially for the masters, because masters folks are immunocompromised for the most part, we weren't traveling anywhere. So everything was virtual and there was no end in sight for it. So I was just kind of like, I don't really want to do this anymore. And the online thing just got really 
orbs to me very quickly. How does that even work? They, is it like an honor system where they can see if you've done a good lift, basically, if you have the right angles? So there's, yeah. So you would have to film from the front, just like they would, you know, from the, the, the head judge is always the one that's sitting right in front of you. They do have judges on the side that make sure that, you know, one of your elbows doesn't bend or anything like that, but you can pretty much see that from straight on. You don't have to hit depth. There's no depth requirements for snatch and a clean and jerk in the weightlifting world. Um, so you getting power clean, obviously. <laughs> so it doesn't like they're not, they, all they need to see is that your arm, your elbows have not rebent, and that's pretty much it. Um, so there were two different ways that they did the online competitions when it first, when COVID first hit, they basically just, you registered for the meet and you videotaped however, your, your three attempts, right. And you had to take your three attempts within a certain period of time. And they made you, you had a time, there was an app that you could use that had a timestamp on it. So you weighed in, you showed yourself weighing in, and then you had to do your first lift within, I think an hour of your weigh in. So your timestamp was on your weigh in and then your timestamp was on your three attempts. And you didn't even have to take three attempts if you didn't want to, if you only wanted to do one, or only wanted to do two, you could call it at one or two. Um, but the reason I did not like it was because there was, there's no clock. So in a meet, you have a clock, you have one minute to hit your lift. And then you have a one minute clock for the next lifter while people change plates. In a competition setting, there's a lot of gameplay that goes on. So if the person after me is going to lift one kilo more than me, they can change that call and bump up two kilos, which means I'm next again. So I now, I just lifted and I now only have one minute of rest versus two or potentially even three. So there's a lot of gameplay that goes on in the back room by the coaches. And you don't get that in a virtual meet setting, which is why I didn't like it because I like to kind of mess with people, right? So <laughs> that's just why I, li I like to do that in a meet setting to kind of test people's resiliency and ability to kind of figure that out. Right. And people do it to me too. So it's not like it's a, you know, everybody does it to everybody else type of thing. Um, later as COVID progressed, they did start to make the meets online. So you could actually see everybody's like you sort of logged into a system and you could see all the lifters lifting and you had a clock. Um, I didn't do any of those cause you would need a coach with you to, to do that. Um, and I just, I never signed up for a meet that was in that type of scenario because I was here in Hawaii and I didn't have a coach and didn't want to deal with that. Um, but they did try to make it more realistic as COVID progressed so that it was more meat like in that scenario. And things are coming back, right? Or have you seen more? Yeah. Conditions? Oh yeah. So they've, they've now sort of brought back, um, this past year, they did have masters nationals in Utah. Um, they canceled worlds, um, in Japan, which is kind of when I decided to stop. Um, but I think they're going to do worlds next year in Florida. But for me at this point, it's, I'm kind of over it and to travel back to the mainland to Florida to do a meet from Hawaii is just, nah, ain't doing yeah, it. That would <laughs> Japan would have been pretty even performance. Yeah. I mean, Japan would have been a not bad trip, but to fly to, you know, Orlando, Florida from Maui, Hawaii is just, I'd have to go like a week in advance to acclimate myself to the time and tickets are three to $4,000 each way. Like I'm just mm, not doing it. Yeah. It's a hobby. Right. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do that to myself financially or physically for a hobby. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is kind of a big jump from what we were talking about, but I wanted to touch <laughs> on it because I saw this on your Instagram and I thought it was fascinating. Your thoughts on GMOs, and organic and uh, most people in the industry, I feel like we expect them to say, oh, no, genetically modified is bad. It is not bad. Uh, my husband actually wrote that article. So he's the one that did all of the research for that one. Um, and his article is just it is so well written and so well explained in terms of the 
different pesticides that are used, the effects on the plants, the effects on the animals, the effects on the environment um, genetically. And I would encourage everybody to actually read the article that he wrote because it, it goes into literally everything. And there's the, the sources that he cites, I mean, are just, there's a plethora of them. Um, But GMOs just like pretty much everything else get a bad rap for, I I understand where, where it originated from. um, But the data does not really right now support them being a more inferior product to something that is organic. Now I will tell you here in Hawaii, Organic is often cheaper (laughs) than conventional. Yep. So we sometimes do buy organic here only because it's cheaper. And because everything here is pretty much organic and there's not much that's not organic. So because of the the supply of organic is greater here, it's actually often cheaper. But I, I sort of classify GMOs as the same way that I do sugar, right? So it, 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 over time, I feel like this industry is really good at like picking one thing and just making it sound really, really, really terrible and using poor studies to support their stance. So a lot of studies that people post, like the, the people that are, that sort of demonize these things, they're cherry picked. And yes, you can cherry pick any study to prove any point that you want. But if you actually look, and this is where gen pop, doesn't have, they don't have the knowledge and expertise to read a scientific study and actually understand what they're reading. So people that have never taken a statistics course, they don't know how these trials are actually designed. They don't understand study population. Um, A lot of people are looking at rat studies when rats, rat studies are good for showing us where we need to do additional research, but that's about it. In terms of their applicability to humans, slim to none. So a lot of the sugar stuff is rat studies, and it really does not have much applicability to humans and how we actually go through metabolizing things. So people are not great about looking at publications and understanding a what they're reading in the first place. A lot of people will send us articles and I I will look at it and we'll say, this doesn't even say what you think it's, it actually says the opposite of what you think you're saying. And so it just, it's they frustrating. Read the <laughs> they read the title and they read the abstract, right? And that's usually the problem is people are reading the abstracts and they're not actually looking at the design. So the study design is critical to actually understanding the analysis of that data and how it applies to gen pop. So I would definitely encourage everybody to, because I didn't write it, my husband wrote it. Um, I would encourage everybody to, it's on our website, um, MauiAthletics.com. It's in our blog. It is a phenomenal article on GMOs. Phenomenal. Not that I don't need to be scared of them. <laughs> don't need to be scared of them. No, definitely not. <laughs> Although whatever, I'm just going to move to Hawaii and walk 20,000 steps a day. There you go. Organic. <laughs> It's been so, it's been interesting moving here from the mainland because back when we lived in North Carolina, I would go to bed at night at like 11, 1130, wake up at six, never really felt super well rested, obviously, because I wasn't getting a full eight hours of sleep, but I actually wake up at 4am here. And I go to bed at about seven, seven thirty, And that's because I keep East coast hours for my my day job. I actually work for a pharmaceutical company during the day. Um, and I, so I work East coast hours and I have found that getting up with the sun and going to bed when the sun sets, I feel so good every day, every day. I feel phenomenal. That's such a Hawaii so, thing to say. Yep. <laughs> I'm in tune with the sun now, but it like, it is interesting about, you know, sort of circadian rhythm and sort of how that kind of resets your clock. I just don't ever really feel super tired living here. I'm getting much more sleep. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's not too bad. It sounds like we should all be doing it. And it's That's right. basically impossible for all of us to do it. <laughs> it is. It is. I, I mean, I will say, I know I'm actually planning a trip back to the East coast in October Um, and I'm going to try to stay on the time that I have here, which means I'll be going to bed 
at like 1 30 in the morning and getting up at about 10. Um, and I'm already dreading it. Cause I know I'm going to feel like, I'm going to feel like crap. Party. <laughs> Dang. The moon party. Those blackout curtains. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Max, you want to ask the one question, the only question we ask everyone? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, how do you incorporate alcohol into your training? That is a great question. Great question. Um, I personally drink once or twice a month. Um, I am not a fan of fitting alcohol into your macros to like plan it into your day. I am a fan of drinking responsibly when you want to drink and enjoying an adult beverage like an adult. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're drinking more than a couple of times a week, you just have to understand how that's going to impact your training. So alcohol inhibits judgment, right? So if you're drinking more than you probably should, you're more likely to eat something that probably doesn't align with your goals. You're not going to sleep as well. You're not going to recover as well. Um, But that's not to say that you can't enjoy a nice adult beverage from time to time. Um, We just, most of our clients that we have that really like to drink, we just say, be responsible about it. And if you show up to a check-in and you haven't met the goals that you wanted to meet for that particular time period, the first thing that we're going to look at is your alcohol consumption because it's the easiest thing to manage for. And we have some people that they'll, they'll start and they will be a 10 to 12 drinks a week drinker. And to bring that person slowly down, I'm willing to concede two drinks a week, every week for that person when that's personally more than I think is necessary. Um, but for that person, for them to enjoy their life in a sustainable manner, two drinks a week is what they want to do. Then we'll work with that person to get to that level. But we don't really have people calculate stuff into their macros or do anything like that. If you want to drink, have a drink and enjoy it. We don't like to Tetris things. <laughs> but you can see when someone, when someone cuts out all the birds, you can see their everything take off. Is that <laughs> pretty much? Yeah. I mean, alcohol is a metabolic toxin. So your body is going to prioritize the metabolism of that alcohol over everything else first, that it's first order of priority is getting that alcohol out of your system. So if you eat something in conjunction with that alcohol, and let's say it's pizza, you're going to pretty much store that what? as fat. Pizza and alcohol. What would that ever? <laughs> Is that a Hawaii thing or? <laughs> <laughs> little beer, a little pizza. <laughs> but yeah, that's it's. And it's usually the easiest thing to get rid of because it doesn't contribute any nutrients. It doesn't fill you up. It doesn't sustain you in any way. And it really, for a lot of people, I don't think they understand actually how much it affects their training and their recovery. And the moment they cut it out, they feel infinitely better. Sleep. Yeah. That's the one that got me. <laughs> Especially yeah. my device is being like, um, did you drink last night? I'm like, <laughs> I do feel like crap. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> but I mean, we, we, whenever we do, so when Alan and I go out to eat, we'll typically have one to two drinks with that meal. Um, but we go out to eat once or twice a month and that's pretty much it. Um, I do enjoy a nice adult beverage. Um, another way that you can kind of make those a little bit better is just drinking like whiskey, neat tequila, neat, like just the hard alcohol on its own is usually better like than crossfitter. Yeah. It's usually better than mixing it with some sort of sugary juice or like regular soda or that type of thing. Um, you can minimize damage in that way. Um, and both my husband and I are bourbon drinkers, so it's easy for us because we just usually just drink whiskey and eat and that's it. All right. Yep. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And, uh, where can the fit heads go find more about you? So they can go to our company Instagram page, which is at Dr. Alan Bacon. Um, my Instagram page is at BP Bacon 13. And our website is MauiAthletics.com. Awesome. Love it. And thank you again. <laughs> thank you for having me. I had a great time.
Yeah. And thank you to the Fitheads. If you can rate and review on Apple Podcasts, that helps us out a whole lot. And we'll see you next week.